Blessing, 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 blessing. Yes. Oh, bless Hello. you, Danny. Welcome, Danny. Welcome, Soso Inak. Welcome. Good to see you guys all. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, Peter. Right back at you, Danny. Happy to see you in the day. I keep him at this. Blessing, Jan. God bless you, guys. Thank you for coming in. God bless you, Vanessa. Blessing, blessing, Vanessa. God bless you, guys. Thank you for coming in. Pastor bless, oh my God, Papa, Papa, God bless you, welcome. bienvenido. Seven, God bless you. God bless you all coming in. Just be kind to share this video with somebody else. God bless you, God bless you. Yeah, we're happy to see you guys too. Even though we don't see you, we can see you in the spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. Be kind and share this video with your friends. Create some washing party and all those stuff. Yes, tonight will be a good night. Your name is Deborah Gray. Welcome, Shriva. You are the wisdom. Before Welcome, Pastor I Theo. Did. Good to see you. Hello, hello. You are God, both Hi, Orly. You are Jesus, are Jesus Christ. Christ. The enemy of Israel. The enemy of Israel. God, both Christ, the alien of Israel. You are the Lord. Most I are the Lord. You are the Lord. Most I you are the Lord. You are the Lord. You are the Lord. Welcome, welcome. You are the Lord. Most are you are the Lord. You created the heavens and the earth. You are the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You made the way. We must see Hallelujah. You. Welcome, everybody. Hi, Clo Clo. Good to see you. Hey, baby, right behind. Hey, Sandrine, welcome. Welcome, hello. Hallelujah. Welcome, Hayat. Good to see you, Hayat. Hallelujah. 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 From within me, spirit you take over. Welcome, Sonia. Good to see you. Born upon my altar. Yes. Adelaide, good to see you. Born upon my altar. Hello, Claudia. Spirit you take over. Hallelujah. We're just going to wait. For two more minutes and then we're just gonna go in in our conversation of today. I'm super super excited. Hallelujah. 
about today so we're just gonna give it one more minute if you just come in i want you to push that share button hallelujah if you are here and your pastor is not there please send him tell him you gotta watch this and if you are a pastor send to your congregation say you need to watch this hallelujah hallelujah Praise the Lord. Hi, Mary. Good to see you, Mary. Welcome, Danny. Hello, Shemiza. Good to see you. Hello, from Zile. If you are here, just say hi. We want to see you there. We want to see you. Hallelujah. Ebiti, good to, to see you. Esther, you. good to see you from Edmonton. Emmanuel. Welcome, welcome everyone. Emmanuel. Mm. Hello, Benedicta. Good we to see you. See you. Evangelist Lori, welcome, welcome. We want to mm. hear you from you. Hallelujah. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, Kerry Maki. We want to see you. We want to hear you. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Welcome, Lady. Good to see you, Lady. Hallelujah. We want to see you. We want to see you. We want to hear from you. We want to hear from you. Emmanuel. Hallelujah. Emmanuel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hi, everybody. We want to hear from you. Emmanuel. 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 Hallelujah. Welcome, Yvette. Don't forget to share. We're just going to get into it right away. Hallelujah. Ah. Welcome, Prince. <laughs> Blessing to everybody. We love you. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Today I'm super, super excited. Actually, I feel like a kid inside. <laughs> We're having I, fun, I guess. I get, I get to interview this guy right here. <laughs> so you know, please be praying for me, guys. I have Spread so your many hands. questions, and I don't even know where to start. Anyway, so you guys, at the end, as uh, as we usually do, we're gonna put. Uh, an opportunity for you guys to send your questions, so we can yeah. answer some of them. Of you know, I wish we could answer all of them, but one day we'll have an opportunity. Of Welcome. Course. Thank you, baby. Good to see you. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm glad to be sitting on this hot, hot chair. In a hot chair. Yes. You know. <laughs> so today, I was th I was thinking about what we we could do for this conversation. I started doing. Uh, the last two were amazing, and I mm -hmm. thought about. I mean, to, to interview one of the greatest pastors on this planet. <laughs> oh my God. I, 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 I am so convinced. And for those who know him, that after Jesus, the shepherd, is El <laughs> Elijah. I'm There's so nobody humble. else so on humble. this planet <laughs> who can do shepherding <laughs> like you do. So, <laughs> yeah. I feel so, very humble to hear Oh my goodness, that's who you are, you yeah. know? So after you confirm, yeah, everybody's confirming. <laughs> so I just wanted we have this conversation because I know a lot of people have a, you know, want to know what it is to be a pastor, yes, of you course. know, and I thought what a better time or moment to start having those kind of conversations, mm. you know. Mm. So you guys pretend he's not my husband, okay? <laughs> just for the sake of this conversation, he's a pastor. Yeah. You know, I wish she had prepared me, you know, just pray for me because she didn't prepare me. We live in the same house, but I, I've not been getting the insight and so no. on. So I'm being sitting on this hot chair 
without preparation, just pray for me. Nah, I, I know you have what it takes, you know. You know, you know, church for Christian believers is what we do, is who we are. Mm. So the relationship between a pastor and the congregation is one, one of the most close and important for the work of every believer. True. So I think this conversation is super important mm -hmm. for all of us so that, you know, we can get some kind of clarification, yes. you know, some understanding. And uh, there's no better person I know of on this planet. And I'm going to say it, say it. It's not because he's my husband that can do pastoring like you do, yeah, you know, you. and we thank have uh, testimonies. My life is just a product of who you are, you know, thank you. Uh, you being my pastor. So not only you are a pastor, but you are a pastor of pastors. Mm. You are an apostle and God has given you the Somebody has the goosebumps. Yeah, you know, that's how I feel inside. Uh, yeah, exactly. Pray for me, oh. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> you do pastoring well. It's who you Thank are. You, you know, you. so if you are a member, if you are a pastor, you are in for a treat. So, Apostle, my pastor. Yes, baby. I'm gonna prepare. I'm gonna pretend I don't know, you know, for the sake of the conversation. You know. How long have you been pastoring? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. And as I was saying, I, I really wish you would have given me the questions before coming standing on this stage. But my wife, she doesn't play around. We so, flow. so anyhow, but I want to say thank you for having yeah. me. And I really appreciate the word you're saying going straight to my heart. Uh, I've been pastoring since 1998, uh, that is uh, 21 years ago, but I've been the senior pastor since 2005, so that will take us to 15 years this year. Yeah, you know, something happened, you know, when he came to the Lord, he became a different human being, I don't know, it's like something happened to you, you just became a preacher right away, a pastor right away, mm -hmm. you know, from an engineer yeah. background. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Something happened. It was so visible. <laughs> and it's almost like, I don't know, like God just, yeah. I don't know, explain. Yeah. You know, um, the greatest mystery on the prophetic walk of God mm. is the mystery of encounter. And I will say it, my salvation was such an encounter. Let me put it that way. Mm. Um, it turned everything around for me. Uh, it was really drastic. Uh, it was impactful. It was an encounter. Let me put it that way. So coming out of that encounter from my salvation, I knew in my heart I don't want to do anything else if possible than just to preach the gospel and be a spokesperson for Jesus that I had not known really. That's right. Just having an encounter, I didn't know much about the Bible because of my background, but I just know that I know from that encounter, I wanted to be with him and I wanted to, spoke, to speak for him. So the encounter really was the starting point of the ministry call in my life. So yeah. imagine me having a man like him in my life it was like 24 <laughs> preaching 24 hour preaching <laughs> day in day on and i don't regret it because it has made me who i am right yeah so we've done a lot blessing. we've really done those my, my family was my guinea pig right you know i remember years ago we used to live actually in the airdrie and uh i had a heart to see people saved and so we'll invite people at home and i didn't know really much about the bible and after we finish to eat, I will just go to the bathroom with my Bible. And sometimes I will stay there for 25 minutes. People are wondering, what is going on to this man? But I'm looking into the Bible, trying to find a verse that I will understand. So at the end, I will come and share with the people and give an altar call. And it was not easy because I had no training at all in that area. And some of you watching, you can testify. Pastor Sebed is watching. You were one of those people who were a part of that movement from the beginning of time. So. so now, would you say it's your preaching capacity that brought you 
in that area of pastoring because suddenly yeah. people started showing up mm -hmm. up in our house yeah. and then you start a ministry it's it's like they were like magnet it oh it was gorgeous yes, i don't know of course uh -huh. you know i will say probably the greatest things it was not my preaching capacity i don't believe so even though in a early age i had a gift of revelation to understand really scriptures out of a normal way let me put that way it was not an ability it was a gift god gave me mm -hmm. but i will say it, it was the fact that i, I loved the people mm -hmm. i just wanted to hang around i had no agenda mm -hmm. i just wanted people to come to our house i wanted we hang around and have fellowship and 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 talk about anything so that love that's probably was the greatest thing that was that's that right. madness i can say that way because people felt comfortable i was not after anything and that was my way of living just being with people and loving people yeah, yeah. so you know i know there, are, there might be some people watching us some people you know who have few questions who might be called who are mm -hmm. not sure if they are called and uh, how, did you know you were a pastor when you just came <laughs> to the lord uh, did you have any even an idea what it was because you know it's interesting and, uh, the question you're asking I didn't know that I was called to be a pastor mm -hmm. but I knew I was called to work for God mm -hmm. I, I didn't know in those days there's what we call the fivefold ministry I just feel like wow I, I would like to be a spokesperson for God traveling and tell people about the testimony that I've just have through this encounter of my salvation but I didn't understand there was fivefold ministry prophet evangelist pastor apostles and teachers I had no clue of those things, right. but I just knew down deep within from that encounter that I will be with this Jesus thing, not just somebody who's sitting in the pews, but somebody who will be a spokesperson, but not specifically as a pastor. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, uh, that was 1998 here in Alberta, in uh, Alberta. Mm -hmm. and then um, you enter into, into your calling as a, as a shepherd. I, I remember before even, you, you know, you got into the you know, official pastoring ministry. You used to say, my calling is to be a traveling minister. Yeah. I am not a pastor. Yeah. So why, why, why were you saying that? Because everything about you was pastor, you know? Why would you say, were you yeah. running away from it? Yeah. Or what, what was it? You know, I'm, I'm, it's interesting that you remember that. Yeah. You know, I know I, I will be a preacher, but I just didn't like being locked down because whenever I would look at a pastor, I say, okay, this guy, is locked in with these people forever <laughs> now my personality i'm a shepherd uh, i'm from a tribe of a shepherd i'm a nomad for those who understand and my personality is even sitting in my own house for a whole day get me yeah. crazy right you can testify yeah. i have to jump out and get in my car and just drive around going nowhere <laughs> just, <laughs> so I was thinking, oh my goodness, if I have stayed to be a pastor 20, 30, 40 years in the same spot, I will lose my mind. So because of that, I thought, no way. There's no way I will be a pastor. I will be a travel minister because it was fitting my personality. Uh -huh. It was fitting my desires. And I remember, uh, peace to her soul, uh, Margo, that some of you know, one day had a dream and she told me, you know, um, I had a dream about you and you were a pastor and then after you're a pastor you start to travel but you ha you were a pastor first I actually thought it was a spirit of divination I, I got mad at her for months you I remember, remember that I story. didn't talk to her I feel like this woman is full of it I even remember exactly where we were in Airdrie upstairs I in know our home. I just remember that she devastated me with that dream to tell me that I would be a pastor and then after that, then I can travel. I feel like, no, no, no. I will be a travel minister, not a pastor. You didn't hear from God. This is a spirit of divination. I was scattered to pieces. I feel like no way. So anyhow, I just never wanted to be a pastor. <laughs> yeah, so. So, you know, so how can you define what is from who you are, from your experience, from yeah. being church is is you uh how can you define what it is a pastor wow <laughs> all right we can do a theological doctrinal definition going through the scriptures and talk about a, a pastor is a shepherd is one who cares is one who feed is one who protect 
that will be a great definition. Mm -hmm. But from my own perspective, with those years that I've been pastoring, it is um, a question that one man asked me once because he didn't believe in pastoral calling. Mm -hmm. And he asked me, okay, what is a pastor? Mm -hmm. And I knew, he knew the definition of a pastor from the perspective of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. That is a shepherd, that is a man, man or woman who cares or feed and protect and so on. But the Holy Spirit just dropped in me a picture that was literally the representation of my life as a pastor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will give you that picture so you understand the way I see a pastor. It's like one man that his whole hand is burning with flames and is very painful. And then some other person have his little finger mm -hmm. that is on fire. You as the pastor, your hand is burning fully. And you have only one blow of air in your mouth to extinguish your flame. Like, and quench it down. But yet, a pastor's heart will take his burning flame, squeeze it, put it in his pocket, and use his only blow to extinguish the small little flame that burn on the finger of a sheep hoping that God will blow his own hands that's burning. Mm -hmm. So it's sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Let me put it that way. If I can use, this is the picture for me, the ultimate. And that's the way I felt like I have lived my life as a pastor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's more sacrifice than preaching, than giving good revelation. Sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Where sometimes we take our last blow mm -hmm. of air and we have a whole hand burning then you squeeze it in your pocket and you use that blow to quench somebody's little finger, hoping God will see from heaven and blow on your own hands. That's for me, pastoring mm -hmm. is sacrifice. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So now the Bible says that the fivefold ministry is a high calling. Um, is it because of the price it it takes to do the high calling, the sacrifice you're talking about, or because you're taking care of the souls of humanity. Yes, yes. The Bible do talk about the high call mm. of the fivefold ministry. Mm -hmm. And number one, there's other calls, mm -hmm. but there's a high call. Mm -hmm. And you say it right, it's because of the internal, um, the eternal mm -hmm. factor that the soul of man is exposed to. Mm -hmm. You can have a call to be a professor, to raise people, to become engineers or business people and so on. And it's a call, mm -hmm. and it's a noble call. But yet, the soul can go to hell. Mm -hmm. So what makes the fivefold ministry call a high call is because of the expenses of the soul, mm -hmm. the importance of the soul. Mm -hmm. It is an eternal matter that we are involved in. Mm -hmm. Not just a success on the earth by a training, but bringing people through the gospel to be saved so their soul can be redeemed and their name written in the book of the Lamb. Amen. And that's why it's called a high call, number one. Number two, it's because of the cost mm -hmm. that is involved as well. A very high cost that is involved. We can look in the life of the disciples. They all get beheaded, all get crucified, all get killed, all get tortured. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody will say those were in those days, but there's always a cost. It is just converted in different ways. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's a high call. Mm -hmm. And also the nobility of that call to be connected to God, representing Christ unto man and being a spokesperson, this gospel that give life and take people from hell from perdition into salvation and eternal Amen. life. Yeah. Amen. That's it's, how much it is a privilege, you know. It's a privilege. Mm. Ah, just listening to you saying that, it just shows me how God loves us so much. Yeah, he does. Yeah. He does. But, yeah. Now, you know, what is it that you love the most about being a pastor? <laughs> 
You know, there's a lot of stuff I really like as a pastor, but mm -hmm. I will give probably one thing. Is when you see the power of the simplicity of the gospel transforming mm -hmm. individuals. I mean, people from broken background are hearing this simple gospel and another person rise within them mm -hmm. and begin to glorify God in everything they do. It is that supernatural turnaround that I have seen so often that they feel like, wow, just a word without a brainwashing, just the power of the word of the gospel that turned people around. I really enjoyed that to see how God can take somebody from minus and take them to plus and seeing how you can pour your life the gift of God in people and see how they rise up to become champion, to become demonstrators mm -hmm. of this gospel. That is the delight to me and the pleasure and the encouragement that I really like. You know, so, <laughs> so, you know, when God started speaking to me that I was called to be a minister of the gospel, I used to look at you. The way you take care of people, run after people, and I'll be like, I will just disqualify myself. It is hard, you know, to take after a man like him. I will disqualify myself saying, pastoring is not my thing, definitely. Yeah. Because I looked at you, who you were, and how you did pastoring. And I thought, there's no way I can, I can, I can do that. Yes. Would you say that pastoring also... The way God uses it is related to your personality, the gifts, the talents that God yes. has given you. Yeah. You know, um, my wife just said, and many times she'll say, you know what, I might not think I'm called to be a pastor because when I look at you, I can't do it this way. And I will tell her, but you don't have to do it this way. The reality is, like in every domain, there are different types of expression of an anointing or a calling. In other words, though we are all called, those who are called to be a pastor, though we are all pastors, but we do not display pastorship the same way. The same way God has not created two people to be the same. Yet, we are operating under the anointing of pastoring. I will give an example. There is a pastor that will excel more in preaching and teaching. I say excel more. In other words, the greatest expression of pastorship will be seen in the power and the demonstration of the anointing of preaching, of teaching, the impartation, the transformation in the life of people. They can visit people, they can run after people, but that will not be the major. Mm. There is other pastors where they will run after people. That's one of me will run after people, visit people, call people, text people, even people who insult them. It's like you're a slave to the call. <laughs> you just end up positioning yourself to be slapped, but yet you still run after them. And then he may not be as a great preacher. He can teach, but not at the same amount of display of the anointing of preaching or teaching. But he's a pastor as well. He is the pastor as well. And there is pastors who can teach, not at the highest moment place, who can go visit and run after people, not the highest place, but they are administratively mm -hmm. amazing. Organization, administration, that I didn't have it. Administration, organization, and so on. Creating a platform where shepherding begins to be easy and more effective. So, if you do not understand that, you can judge a pastor by saying, ah, he's not a pastor because when people are sick, he doesn't run after them as much as this other pastor do. Mm -hmm. Then they know all just to preach and impart the glory of God on people's life, stir up people, bring deliverance to people and give them directions, right? And there are other pastors where their major is in counseling. Mm -hmm. I mean, you sit down with them, they will cry with you. They will have wisdom above mm. and give you directions. But yet, if you give him a microphone in front of people, he can teach, he can preach, but it will not be with the dimension of impact that another one will do. So we are all pastors in that confine, but we operate depending 
of what God has entrusted to each person and the domain where God has put you and the grace God has put on each person and your personality and all this stuff that goes on. Just the same way, we are all different even in the diff other field. So I think it's important to know, though we are pastors, there's not only, a, only one specific description of uh, how to display pastorship. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what, so when I look at your life, you can preach the word of God, but more in an administrative perspective, very strong, very powerful, with a CEO mind type. I don't have that, right? So you will excel in that area to create a platform for growth and order, mm -hmm. administratively speaking, you know? And, and of course, uh, check with people on the phone and stuff like that, and then you do it very well. I, I will run and go back and forth. So we, we are still all pastoring. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it makes sense what I'm explaining. That's right. Yeah, yeah. it makes so, so much sense. If you have a question, if we can ask question at the end. Now, um, has it happened a time in your life as a pastor, you questioned your calling, if you are really called to do this? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it did happen in my life where I feel like, gee, enough is enough. But never question if I was called to do it. Okay. Never. Because from the beginning, I know. <laughs> he didn't even nobody prophesied to me. I know that I am a pastor. I, even if I say I'm not, it's a denial, right? It will be a re reacting. But I know within, I never questioned that part, that I'm called to be a pastor. Never. Which is a, it's a blessing because I know a lot of men of God pastors they questioned for mm -hmm. one reason or another. True, true. No, so as a person of a servant of God, could you maybe, uh, you know, you've been around ministers, pastor, that some people may not be called to be pastors, but they find themselves in that position. Yes. Like, how do you know if you are truly a uh, pastor or not? This is a deep question. Mm -hmm. I would like to expand a little bit on it. Number one, the fivefold ministry call is not a majority call. Mm -hmm. This is very important that I mention that. Mm -hmm. uh, prophets, though we are a prophetic people, I'm talking about the office, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. Prophets, teachers, and stuff like that. In the Old Testament, there was only one tribe out of 12, the tribe of Levi, that was called to tend to the needs of the people in the temple. This is very important that I mention that is not the majority of Christians who are called to the fivefold ministry. They are called in the shepherding, right? They are called as a prophetic people, but not the majority to the office, that's what I mean, right? So it's important we mention that and make it clear. Here is sometimes the danger. Whenever a person is gifted, spiritually speaking, love prayer, right? Love worship. Immediately, it will seem like this person is called to the fivefold ministry. Mm -hmm. It's not true. Everybody is called to love worship and everybody is called to pray. Even though you love to evangelize, you can have an evangelistic anointing, but it doesn't mean you have the office. This, this is so important. I say that because I met a lot of pastors because of the expression and the degree of spirituality that they manifested. They were pushed into fivefold ministry by themselves or others mm. you're right mm. and at the end is calamity they come to get hurt realize the grace has been lifted up i may know how to pray i may know how to even preach and give the word but yet why the church is not growing why things are not moving forward i'm not saying that the church should always grow but you get in a place where you know you are fighting against a wall that does not move, regardless what you do. Mm -hmm. And before you realize it, the church begins to shrink to get to 20 people. After 5, 10 years, the church are 20 people. You should question yourself. Am I really called to do that? Mm -hmm. Many people don't question themselves. And they stay there by saying, oh, hey, you know, even though I have 20 people, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not talking about numbers per se. I'm just saying the stagnation of things, that things don't move forward for a long period of time. Even Jesus Christ in the parable of the fig tree, 
told the owner, give one year to that fig tree. If after one year, it does not produce, cut it out. And so we should not be afraid to sit down sometime and take an inventory and really assess to see where are we at in this ministry thing that we join in. So now the question of how do you know? There's many ways how you will know that you're called. For me, I was called by encounter. I had dream where God spoke to me very clearly. I'm calling you to be a preacher. When I'll just get born again, I didn't know it would be a pastor. Years on, growing with God, serving in the church, God visited me again in dreams. I'm like a Joseph guy, I dream. And show me, I was leading sheep. And so many times I have those dreams. And then lion will come to attack the sheep and I will fight the lion and sometimes it's a bull. So all those stuff speak about a shepherding perspective. Mm -hmm. The greatest key, it is to keep serving in the church. Don't sit down passive thinking it's going to show up. If God does not show it to you in a dream full of prophetic word or in the small still voice, just keep serving in the church. Don't separate yourself from the church if you really believe you're called to the fivefold ministry. Because you cannot serve a people that you're not connected with. Mm. So for my wife and I, we serve in the church in the cleaning team. Even though we know one day it will happen. But if you are serving, the Holy Spirit has a way to move your heart toward different directions. And the leaders around you will probably begin to see something in your life. Mm. And reach out to you to build you up by the wisdom of God. By the counsel of God. To lift you up. And that's what I will explain. Just submit to leadership. Mm. Serve. And seek God. He is able to tell you through a dream or a vision. Through a prophetic word. And even when he tells you. You don't go and make it happen. You still keep serving. And at the right time. He knows how to raise you up. Amen. So there is no really one way to find it out. Alright. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. It is that conviction that's within that void that speak to you mm -hmm. uh, I know you didn't ask that questions I think beside how to you know you're a pastor it is the time the timing mm -hmm. to step into that's pastorship right. or into opening a church mm -hmm. or something like that or in your ministry as an evangelist or a travel minister mm -hmm. the timing is even more important than the knowing because a lot of people know, but because they miss the timing, it can turn into a calamity. Mm -hmm. You see? Yeah, you know, I remember I always felt like, you know, when I was ordaining the ministry, that I was put into it too early. Mm -hmm. And uh, which became True. for me a burden uh, because then I had Amadou, I had yes. cheese. So it was very Young overwhelming kids. because even if, quote, quote, you're not doing it, the very knowledge that, that you're a pastor, there's an expectation, not so much from people, mm. even from you. Yes. You have to be a pastor. Why are you not acting, behaving? You know, you're not doing anything. So I always felt it was too heavy for yes, me. Yes, true. You know, and sometimes the, the, it looks like it's, the, it's nice to be a pastor. It's powerful. And then people find themselves too early into it that, it becomes too hard at yes. the end of the day yes. to carry. That was mm. my situation. Mm. And I, I would like to say something about that. Mm -hmm. uh, especially women or men, when you get in anything, now we are talking about pastorship, so let's mm -hmm. keep it in the pastorship. Whenever you get in anything out of its timing, mm -hmm. even the place of blessing can become a calamity. Mm -hmm. So it's very important. Mm -hmm. Just may not, now talking about a wife pastor. Mm -hmm. It had happened, for example, with some of our ministers, um, some of our churches, cross point churches, where um, the, the wife has to be ordained. And uh, I spoke to the wife and said, listen, I've seen this with my own wife. When we were released in the ministry, it was very hard on her. Uh, because we have an autistic child, uh, there was a lot of burden already, and the child was young, uh, and Rafaela was young as well. And so on the top of taking care of 
those responsibility at home and still run and take care of sheep it was not easy at all and so i will tell them hold it and sometimes we do that not because you hear from god but because of practical wisdom listen you have two three four kids and the oldest is six years old uh your husband is pastoring yes you have a call to pastor as well but the best is to wait and let your husband do what can be done when you take care of the children at home a little bit. If you engage into it, once the oil fall on your head, listen to me, it doesn't matter how old you are or how much responsibility is at home, the devil will come according to the oil you carry. You begin to attract demonic powers and opposition as if you because you are in, you are in fully now. We are not dealing with civilian. We are dealing now with military, right? You have a uniform now, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, the people in the church, they will not care if you have 20 children at home or not. We know you are the pastor. You must deliver according to what we know you are. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, my Lord Jesus. Yeah. Anyhow. We, which I'm so grateful for. Cross Point Fellowship, Cross yeah. Point Nouvelle Espoir. You've amazing been the people. most amazing people <laughs> on this planet. Yeah. I just thank God for, for all of you. Yes. Uh, yeah. So it, then it come, you come to a place where you resent yes. the very cold you are called to do. Yes. When the timing is not right. Yes. And uh, now I'm speaking to you as an apostle, where an apostle will notice somebody, the call, you can see somebody as a call of the pastor. Mm, mm, mm. And then they would place them in the call, in the ministry right away. It can be very, uh, it can have a very negative effect yes. uh, for that person. And then people who are, you know, you are young, you are you're zealous for the Lord and you just want to serve God. So you say yes to an ordination, yes. but you don't realize really what you just put yourself into, right? That's right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. timing, like you just said, timing so, matters. So important. You know, we're just talking. I remember one of our dear daughter, Pastor Vanessa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she, she, the girl has four children mm -hmm. in, in Toronto, Cross Point. And in those days with Pastor Christian. I mean, she has four children, mm. uh, you know, and you have to stand as the pastor. It's a lot to carry. Mm -hmm. Great sacrifice. Now, talking about an apostle, you know, when you're an apostle, you're a territory taker. Mm -hmm. Everything you see, come on now, let's go. We're going to take ground, right? It has nothing to do with just opening church for church's sake. Mm -hmm. You always see how you can impact a community and a group of people. You know, you're not, you're not believing you can take the city by yourself. No, that, that's, that's, that's not the way it is. You know there is a little portion for you in that city to capture. Mm -hmm. And you see the opportunity. It's like a business person mm -hmm. who see an opportunity and if like, my God, let's get this thing done. Even there, you need to be careful of the timing. And so as an apostle... I had to watch my heart. <laughs> my God. You know, it's amazing. You, you, you will release people, of course. But we need to make sure that the people have acquired at least the basic pastoral training. Mm. What it takes to carry on a church. That is very important. So we are not blinded by just the fuel to take territories and all this stuff, all right? Mm -hmm. And also for the young lion there and the young lioness, sometimes you feel the calling pumping within. Mm -hmm. They give popping within. They say, when is Apostle going to release me now? When am I going to be launched out to go start my ministry? You know, we've all been there. Again, there, we need to talk about it. We need to be patient. And at the right time, it's always better than the wrong time. You know, I remember there was a time, I mean, people were after you. You can open your own church. Why are you being mm -hmm. in this church just serving as a regular? You're powerful. So the temptation will ah, always yeah, yeah, be yeah. there, right? So especially, especially the people who are calling me to go preach in Belgium, in different places. It was not church. It was what I really thought I was called to as a trial minister. And it was so tempting. I mean, you feel like, yeah, finally my time has come. 
but yet down deep within, mm. you know you are still connected to the obnical cord of a man that God has put in your life, that his voice sounds like the voice of God, just like Samuel and Eli. Regardless, you feel an accountability mm -hmm. and redeemability to be able to say, you know, I'm feeling this. My pastor, what do you think? All right? Uh, not disappearing and begin to get offended and frustrated and mm -hmm. begin to find problems with the church and with the people so you can make out a way for you to just step out thinking, no, nobody's recognizing my gift. Be careful on those things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. God just have a way to find David, even though he's in the backyard. That's right. Mm. That's right. Amen. Now, what would, would you say are the, the tears of a pastor that <laughs> you would want <laughs> congregation member to know? <laughs> what is it? you know that makes a pastor cry you know they say that uh, there are some different type of tears mm. and some release more protein than the others some of you are in the medical or biological field you may probably explain those things all right the the, the number of protein that release in the joyful tears and the sadful tears and the morning tears and the angry tears so on wow uh, I will just say probably one thing. One of the things that is, will make a pastor cry, there's a lot, but I, I will just say a couple. Mm -hmm. It's when you believe in your heart, you've done your best. I say your best. I'm not saying the perfect. Mm -hmm. I say the best. Uh, for a family or a person, and uh, the people leave the church by dishonoring you mm. without even consulting with you mm -hmm. and then you're hearing rumors of the thing they are saying about you i mean it's devastating mm -hmm. we, we don't talk about it often but it's very 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 devastating um and you feel like huh uh false accusations wicked talk very hurtful accusation of every kind and sometimes you're shocked of course nobody told you that you, you just hear it from other people and so that's very hurtful mm -hmm. very very hurtful mm -hmm. uh when you're misunderstood you know you can make a mistake then people take it to another level uh that is hurtful as well and of course when you see a potential in the life of a person and you see, this person is one step away from the next level of elevation and greatness. Mm. And they turn into the world and go back into the old vomit. Mm. You look at the investment God has done in their life and suddenly they throw the whole thing out and turn into another direction. It's very painful. Mm -hmm. So for me, yeah, those ones are my toughest ones just to feel punch in the back and and i mean it's a point somebody leave a church you know the church is like a bus it, it stop at a stop some come down some goes up it's okay nobody should stay in the church forever that's not the point the point is when you leave the church uh do you destroy the church do you talk against it do you create calamities around it because sometimes people feel like they have to justify the fact that they left the church Mm. to give themselves a sense of uh, peace or people may understand them. So I left it because of that. So they thought, wow, you, you did well to leave, all right? Because you got to show that it was so bad, mm. I have to leave. And uh, it doesn't do good because it's harm the kingdom of God and it's harm the pastor, the other members and everything else that goes on. So that's very painful, yeah. being misunderstood being stabbed in the back, being thrown left and right, dishonored in every corner, mm -hmm. point fingers, uh, despised. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Those are tears for sure. And, mm -hmm. and I have a few of those. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> then if you, if you were to speak to somebody who just started a church, you know, uh, where maybe few congregation member you know, mm -hmm. that pastor has to think about the family, taking care of the family, taking care of the ch children, taking care of the church that just started. What would you tell that pastor 
what yes. our congregation member are looking for yeah. in a pastor yes all right um i, I really believe what people are looking in the pastor mm -hmm. it is acceptance mm. uh, somebody who will accept them the way they are uh, presence mm. somebody accepting them but also being there for them mm -hmm. i don't believe congregation are looking for the greatest preacher and mm -hmm. how powerful you are and that's the mistake pastors mm. we make sometimes mm. we think the more i perform in mm. demonstrating the power of god it will keep people around Mm. Uh, people will follow you for your power and your gift just for a little bit. Mm -hmm. After that, they realize there is a need in their life that power will not solve. Mm. There is emotional need, there is presence need that your demonstration of gift and power will not solve. You can use power to heal people, you can use power to deliver them, but at the end of the day, there is something in the heart of each person that needs acceptance mm -hmm. and that needs love. Mm -hmm. So to you pastors who are starting, uh, preach well, it's important, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, don't think that is your strongest point. Mm -hmm. Your strongest point is to love people, to be there, and to make them feel accepted. Mm -hmm. Not always correcting them, mm -hmm. not always telling them what is wrong with them. In other words, to have a heart of a father, if I can put it that way. Does That's it make right. sense? That's right. Yeah. 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 And, and, and you are starting this question, and I feel like mm -hmm. uh, even for the pastor starting, I have made this mistake, and I don't want you to make it. Uh, because of my passion and my zeal mm -hmm. for God and for the ministry calling people, uh, I have not been able to balance very well the pastoral ministerial need versus the pastoral family needs. Mm -hmm. And so I found myself in the beginning cheating if I can say that, on the family. Because I grew up hearing, you take care of the other people, God will take care of your own, right? Mm -hmm. I will say that again. You take care of God's people, God will mm -hmm. take care of your children, God mm -hmm. will take care of your wife. <laughs> you just make sure you take care of God's children, mm -hmm. as if our own children were not God's children. But anyway, I made that mistake because I'm a very passionate person, for those who know me. When I put my eyes on something, I'm like a bulldozer. I mean, you stand in front of me, I will run on you. I'm a vision chaser in that way. Uh, I don't spare energy. I don't spare resources. I don't spare anything. I just go for it. And so I not balance very well that. Where it had happened, I have relinquished the rising up of our children to my wife fully. Let me put it that way. Even though I was present, I thought... God and my wife will raise my children, all right? And then me, I will take care of the sheep of God. It was not out of a bad heart. Of course, I love my wife and my children. But I felt like, yeah, this is the deal. I take care of God's children there. God will take care of my deal. So, pastor, balance it very well. There need to be a time for your family, and they need a new time for the people of the church. Mm -hmm. And I have to say it is only in the last few years that I've understood that. Mm -hmm. Very, very important. I have to say that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's in the ending of this year that I begin to say, you know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need, uh, I'm a pastor, but I'm a father and I'm a husband. God will give me grace to be able to fulfill those different hearts that he has entrusted unto me. But important, do not turn your family on the second place and put your ministry on the first place. Mm. Same thing is true for the people who work in the secular world. Mm. You don't put your job before your children. Mm. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. I have learned that the hard way. Mm -hmm. But I thank God by His grace. Uh, my children always knew that I loved them dearly. Mm. And my wife also understood that I loved them dearly. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's what I will let a new pastor know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you know, when I think about all this, about our life, yes, it was hard, but I thank God, you know what? Mm. Because now we can help people. Yes. You know, we can help people because then we know yeah. the mistake not to make, you know? Yes. Like, I mean, being a pastor, it's like just starting a business. Yes. You, yes, you go to school for ABC, but 
until you are into something, mm -hmm. you really don't know exactly <laughs> what you just put yourself into. You know what True. I'm saying? True. So, uh, I think so much more grace needs to be given to pastors. Mm -hmm. Uh, because as much as you can have a you know a, a bachelor a doctorate in theology i mean shepherding is yeah. another level of course you know of because course. you're dealing with different needs different desire different yeah. personality yeah. a lot of expectations yeah. sometimes that is so unhealthy yeah. that even a pastor cannot attend them True. you know but I, I like i like what you said you said you know people just need acceptance yeah you know, yeah. what would you say that the, the pastor need from the congregation? Yeah, yeah. Um, wow. N number one, I want to go back a little bit. Mm -hmm. I felt something in my okay. heart to share. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I, I really want to emphasize because I feel like somebody need to hear that. Mm -hmm. uh, I was so passionate to do this work of God. Mm -hmm. And I'm still. In fact, it's yep. increases, right? <laughs> And my wife sometimes will say, but baby, where are you? I feel like I was casting out a demon out of this guy. Somebody got saved and then she was, but you know, you need to be home and da, da, da. And, and I begin to think in my heart, God Almighty, what type of wife did you give me? You know, why she's not excited about my casting demons and saving this person? Oh my Lord, oh my Lord. You know, it's like a demonic assignment against the ministry and the call and all this stuff. I thought those stuff, and then one God, one day God spoke to me and said, <laughs> "You know, sometimes when you complain to God, you feel like God will say, yeah, yeah, you're right. What the heck does she want? Why don't she? She doesn't enjoy the deliverance and the salvation. You feel like God will just show up and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Keep, amen, amen, amen. No, no, God didn't amen that. God said to me." When are you going to grow up? You're so immature. <laughs> I thought the devil was in my car. I was like, you get never, behind me, devil. <laughs> you never told me that one. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I'm in trouble now. I mean, like, I was complaining, you know, why she cannot rejoice. Yeah, the kids are fine. Look at the kids are fine. She's okay. You know, you live in the house. You have a car to drive. And, uh, you know, I'm always home. Uh, 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 but the call is calling. Somebody needed me. Somebody was possessed at 2 o'clock in the morning. He need deliverance. So I felt like, so yeah, I'm serving God, right? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. And then I will come home with my powerful testimonies and she will look at me like that. And I'll be on fire. <laughs> I'll be like, what kind of woman is this? She's not going to get the fire of God. She's not getting the power of the Holy Ghost that delivers people. Somebody just spoke in tongues and I will go for it. God said, hey, when are you going to mature? I had to change my way. So I realized God was not for me. <laughs> I thought like heaven will amen what I'm saying about my wife. But heaven did not. God does not stand for such. He stands for truth. And so... Those are my experiences that kind of wake me up and make me realize, wow, okay, God, um, uh, you enjoyed this deliverance thing, but I got to grow up. I just wanted to mention that. Is that okay? <laughs> you know, I used to feel like I'm competing with the church. Any pastor's wife can just, they know what we're talking about. No, yeah. awesome. <laughs> you guys need to be kind to pastor's wives. Anyway, so... <laughs> God is so faithful, eh? <laughs> you know, one of the greatest delight a pastor will have is when he feels appreciated for mm -hmm. the sacrifices mm -hmm. he's given. Appreciated is not to give money. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm talking about. It is to be thankful. Mm -hmm. To say, Pastor, this word touched me. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a pastor, even though he is spiritual, mm -hmm. and our domain, it is the domain of life. Mm -hmm. We don't have it all together. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously, some of you are listening to me. You've been my leaders from day one. Mm -hmm. You were my guinea pigs. Mm -hmm. You've seen me stand in front of the pulpit and repent mm -hmm. by saying, you know what? What I preached two Sundays ago, please forget about it. It was not doctrinal. Leave it alone. But yet God has a way to still bless you and still touch you. Right? 
So we are, we are learning as we are moving forward into this thing. We are not an expert. That's the area where you don't get a diploma at the end mm -hmm. because we never arrive. This is the realm of the spirit, mm -hmm. you see? Mm -hmm. And God is entrusting people's life to us. So we take it serious, but yet we don't know everything. We do not know everything. So when people at least are grateful mm -hmm. to be able to say, wow, pastor, thank you. Because they can see the sacrifice the pastor is doing. He has his own children. Mm -hmm. He has a wife. He had to take care of things. And many of them have a business to run, mm -hmm. go to work still. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they are always there for you and, 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 and sacrificing so much, right? Mm -hmm. So when at least people can say, you know, thank you. I appreciate what you do. Wow. I don't take it for granted. This is like a fresh water mm -hmm. that you pour on the heart of a pastor. I guarantee you, he rises up with greater strength to keep running this race. Do not think for a second, yeah, God will comfort him. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Oh, you know, he, he, he has it all together, mm -hmm. right? He doesn't need me to clap hand for him. It, it's, it's him who need to clap hand for him. He's a human being. He put his skirt or his pant in the same manner as we all do. Mm -hmm. He is also walking his own salvation with fear and reverence before God, learning also from his mistake on this prophetic journey that's called salvation. So a pastor needs the support and the encouragement and the heart of gratitude. It goes a million miles for a pastor. Yeah. You know, I feel like we're going to have a second series on this one because <laughs> my brain is going in every direction. I have so many questions, oh so many God. things I would like that we talk about because yeah. it's very, very, very important. Um, and we just, we just finished one hour already. Uh, so you say, you know, the pastor need from his congregation, mm -hmm. gratitude. Yeah. Gratitude, acknowledgement, even if, yeah, encouragement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it takes a lot to put yourself out there in mm -hmm. front of people, mm -hmm. you know, ministering. You're always questioning yourself. Yes. Am mm -hmm. I giving what, what the people need, you yes. know? Because it's not every Sunday God will tell you exactly yeah. what to minister yeah. on. Yeah. So those are struggles that, that most people wouldn't know behind. That is true. You know? Just to give you one, sometimes a pastor will prepare his message and go preach. Mm -hmm. And he finished to preach and he leave the pulpit and he... And he begin to feel like, oh, I, I, I was such a fool. Mm -hmm. What the heck was I talking about? Mm -hmm. The devil begin to bombard his mind. mind yeah. Right? By telling him, this is the worst message you ever preach. Mm -hmm. Trust me, I'm a pastor. Mm -hmm. It happens to me. And there is no experienced pastor mm -hmm. who will say, I passed that level. It's not true. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes the feedback mm -hmm. of the people to say, pastor, my life changed today. That is a weapon to destroy the lives of the enemy yeah. in his mind. Yeah. So the, the guy cannot leave or the woman cannot leave the office thinking, that, yes, devil, you're the liar. Because one person got blessed by this message. Right. Somebody got delivered by this message. Somebody's life was changed by this message. That's why it's important to have feedback from congregation members mm -hmm. who really have received the message and have been touched by the message and have received illumination. Mm -hmm. Feedback are powerful weapon to keep the mind of the pastor away from the bombardment mm -hmm. of the lies of the enemy. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why when we do things, mm -hmm. you may feel like we are doing it so easily, mm -hmm. right? Like for example, uh, this coronavirus came and now we end up doing our stuff live mm -hmm. we in our homes. We never done this before people. Mm -hmm. For the last 14 years, we've been preaching as senior pastors. We, this never happened. We needed to hear from some of you mm -hmm. to be able to say, Pastor, wow, bravo, well done, that you, you are standing in your house and Wednesday, you, you, you give us a teaching. Friday, front line is going. Sunday, you preach in French. Sunday, you preach in English. Bravo, wow, courage, we are receiving it. It's like you are in our home. We are receiving the We need to hear those things. That's right. Because we never done it before. So we don't even know what the heck, if you are liking it or not. Mm -hmm. If you appreciate our effort or not. We don't know. Mm -hmm. This is not standing on the pulpit where we've been rolling on the pulpit for years. Mm -hmm. 
This is a new thing. We're going to learn new technologies. We have to learn to use our phones. We have to learn to have the Wi-Fi that doesn't cut out on us. We have to go purchase new lights. We have to know how to stand up and walk and talk to people without seeing people. Mm -hmm. Right now, we are talking Sundays to congregation we don't see. Mm -hmm. It's not given. Mm -hmm. Many pastors have struggled in this COVID-19 because... They were not trained to be able to speak to the emptiness. Mm -hmm. They were not trained to visualize a congregation. Mm -hmm. So I don't care who your pastor is, how many years been there. Hey, I needed encouragement. My wife needed encouragement. Cross point people, I listen to me. We needed encouragement. Our leaders, we needed to hear, wow, guys, keep it up. You're doing a good job. You're moving forward. It's like you are still doing it. You are still there face to face. <laughs> You know, you're yeah, saying, I'm just speaking it right you, now. You're saying that yesterday I was complaining to somebody. I say, you know, since I started putting all this stuff, I don't get no feedback. And no feedback. So hey, no, it's no like condemnation. It's, no, 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 no. It's not condemnation, but talking. I want you to take notes. <laughs> right? That's the apostolic talking, talking now. You need to take, and if you're not a part of cross point or any other cross point where you are, it doesn't matter. Your pastors need to hear from you. Pastor, thank you. In this coronavirus, you still bring the message to our home. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you still try your mm. best. You learn technology you never learned before. You learn to position light. Pastor, we appreciate it so much. They need to hear. Don't take it for granted. Oh, it's their job to do it. No, 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 no. You need to clap a hand for your pastors in this coronavirus that they do all their best to still keep you updated spiritually. Mm. It's important. Don't take for granted. We need to hear from you. It encourages us to preach better without seeing a congregation. Sometimes we are wondering, do you really like this or not? Are you enjoying this thing on the line or not? We need to hear from you. And if you're not from Cross Point, regardless of the church where you go, I know all the pastors today have to redefine their own way of doing things. Please appreciate them. Clap hand for them and lift the chapeau, the, 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 the hat for them. Anyway, that was Apostle talking. Now, host take over. <laughs> Thank you. My phone is on airplane mode. So by the time I get off this live, I'm expecting at least 200 messages from... <laughs> we love you. We now, adapt you... ourselves to <laughs> yes. everything. What are the greatest fears for a pastor who has a Ooh, congregation? Oh, my God. You know? Now, the greatest fear that the pastor won't tell you mm. is empty chairs. Mm. This is the killer. Now, you know, when you tell that to a novice or a person who's not in the culture, oh, you know what, don't worry, it's God who brings people to church anyway. All right, it's the Holy Ghost who brings people to church. Guess what? If you have a business, it's the Holy Ghost also who brings you clients. Am I right? So why are you stressing out for that? Congregation members are not clients. I do understand. But we have a stewardship, the same way you have a stewardship for your business. To make sure because if we have a congregation to 10 people, we don't need a building. Mm -hmm. We can just sit down at home. And pastors, empty space, kill them. Mm -hmm. True. And empty space, kill the anointing. Mm -hmm. Somebody's going, oh yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever been to Beni in Crusade. There's no empty chairs. It doesn't mean that the stadium is always full. But he understands the anointing, this man. Empty space sometimes will take away from the atmosphere. Mm. So the greatest fear, one of them is that, number one. Number two is rejection. Mm. It's when you do all and yet you feel you're not accepted. Oh, yeah? You mean the pastor can feel not accepted? Of course. Of course. Mm. A pastor can feel not accepted. Can I give you? Jesus was the shepherd of all, but yet he was rejected. Mm. So a shepherd can feel rejected by his sheep. When the sheep despise him. When the sheep look down on him. When the sheep does not honor him. Mm. You feel rejected, even though nobody insulted you. Mm. And that sometimes, it is our greatest fears. It is that rejection. It's that abandonment. It is that being dropped in the street 
from nowhere. That's the greatest fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At least for me. Yeah. So right now my head is going. We need another four sessions with you <laughs> on specific topics, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, on pastors and leaders, pastors and, you know, and members. Yes. There's so much we can talk pastors about. Pastors and families. Pastors and family. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, <laughs> <sighs> yeah, it's beautiful. I don't even know what's next. To go so now the sphere of pastoring yeah uh like when you are a pastor are you the pastor of the world or you're a pastor? <laughs> <laughs> it's important are you the we... pastor of your congregation <laughs> of every human being on the earth yeah it's important we, we clarify for that you know and talk about it because that I, I know there's frustration that comes with that mm. you know number one uh, there is one thing to understand. The goal here is not to go in the Bible and do some teaching. We're talking from a perspective of experience. Mm -hmm. But yet, God gave a gift to a person. Paul said, I operate by the grace that's been given to me. That's very important. And by the level of faith that's been given to me. He goes further in Corinthians, talking about the sphere that's been entrusted mm -hmm. to him. And so we have that's faith, right. we right. have grace and sphere. Don't miss what I'm going to say. Because... Grace operates in sphere. Mm -hmm. When God does not give you a sphere of influence, your grace will not deliver there. Mm. Can you say that again? When God gave you grace, it will deliver in the sphere, sphere that's entrusted to you. When you step out of your sphere, even though you're a pastor, mm. but you're not the pastor of every human being. Mm. It's like being a minister in the government of Canada. Mm. Doesn't mean you are a a uh, uh, minister in the government of Burundi or Rwanda mm. or uh, Haiti. So there's a grace, there's a faith, and there's a sphere. That's mm. very important. Mm -hmm. So you are the pastor in the sphere of your congregation. And you are the pastor in the sphere of the community that God gives you. So it's all dependent on the sphere, of the range of sphere a person has. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> some people have a grace to be a pastor of the people who come only to the church. That's right. This is very important. Yeah. And now people can insult them the way they want, but their grace is not outside of that. Their grace is the man and the woman, regardless of the headache they have, as long as they are a part That's of right. his jurisdiction, he has a grace to operate in that place. Mm. Now there's some other pastors we will have the jurisdiction of the local church and on the top of that, of certain communities where influence given to them in that community. It could be, for example, a pastor who is respected and honored in a community, for example, of Burundian or of Kenyan or people from Saskatchewan or people from Newfoundland and so on, or people from Israel, Jewish. And those communities can be tribal, it can be based on language or colors and so on. And so your pastorship will extend to those places, even though they don't come to your church. They honor you and call you as their pastor. Mm -hmm. When somebody passed away, they will call on you. If a family is going through a headache, they will call on you. And you will feel compelled to go help them, even though they don't come to your church. Mm -hmm. You know God has granted to you that sphere mm -hmm. and grace and faith to bring the light to them mm -hmm. at the capacity you can. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are pastors at national level, at city level, community level, and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's important for the pastor to know mm -hmm. where is my grace operational based on the sphere that God has entrusted to me. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, sometimes people will just call you from the community when they need help. Mm -hmm. And if you're a pastor, we know God did not call me in that perspective to shepherd. Remember, you can preach to everybody, but you're not the pastor of everybody. Mm. You, get, you get me? That's very important. So uh, we are called to preach and, and to be a, a representative of God in our different communities. Uh, it, but you are not the pastor mm. in that way. Mm. You see, I hope you... It doesn't yeah, make yeah, sense it, what I'm it explaining. Makes sense. So it is very vital, pastor, listen, that you understand what is this fear God granted you. That fear can change with time. Sometimes you can be allocated only your congregation. Mm. 
And then with time, God will increase your measure of influence or rule because he will increase your grace, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. And give you favor to help in the community, in giving community and so on. So right. it does not stagnate only in one spot. That's right. right. We go from faith to faith, grace to grace, glory to glory, and so on. That's right. That's mm -hmm. powerful. Now, what would you say, the mistakes that mm -hmm. a pastor makes on the pulpit? Yes. Not even just on the pulpit. Yeah. Even yeah. with the congregation. Yeah. Uh, number one, pastors, especially if you're a pastor, you're called to be one. Listen to me. Mm -hmm. You're a human being. That's right. And sometimes you bleed. Mm. Because you're human, you bleed. You have emotion and feelings. You can feel hurt. Make sure. That's right. When you are still bleeding. Mm. If you're not able to stop the bleeding, don't go preach. Because when you will preach, you will settle matters on the pulpit. Mm. Now, watch me. It had happened in the course of time, some people accused me and said, oh, you're talking about me. Truthfully, before God, I was not talking about them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just preach the word and it fit the situation. And they are convinced that you know the situation. I mean, they should believe you are in the church and this is a spiritual environment and God knows the situation and God can speak through the pastor who consciously has no awareness of the situation. Mm -hmm. It will just match it and then they will think you know their stuff and you're talking about publicly. I know that sometimes it is not true. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, it is our responsibility in the fear of the Lord to always measure our heart. To know when we preach, we don't preach to an individual. That's I like right. to put it this way. Shoot in the atmosphere and let the Holy Spirit distribute to each person according to what he wants them to know. So that's one of the biggest mistakes is to preach from the perspective of frustration and bleeding. And if you do that, you'll begin to attack people. You'll begin to solve your issues and you can hurt people really badly. That's but right. nevertheless... Sometimes it may seem like the pastor is talking about your situation, but it's not because he's aiming at you. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the big mistakes that I've seen. Number two, mm -hmm. very important. And I've made this mistake so many times because I'm an encourager in my roots. Number what? I can see a person coming to the church and because of that heart of love and encouragement, I can speak to that person about the things to come. So it can turn to be like if it's the promise I'm giving him. I can see an evangelistic calling in his life and uh, by the prophetic anointing. It's even very important to be careful that even though God revealed to you, you must measure when is the right time to release such a word to a person. If not, the person can feel like, ah, oh, yeah, it's been two years. You have said that I will be a pastor or you have said that I will be a preacher. And you haven't given the microphone to me yet. So they will take it personal as if you have given them the promise and now mm -hmm. you have failed to fulfill your promise. So we got to be very wise to know what is a prophetic word or something that comes from the heart of the pastor. Mm -hmm. So people now don't take you responsible mm -hmm. for things that you say that you didn't fulfill in their life. Mm -hmm. I made that mistake so many times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the number one. Uh, number two. Number three, one of the biggest mistakes, listen to me, pastor, because of this financial struggle that pastor go through, it is true, not all, but most pastors go through because when you start a church, you start a church, mm. all right? Sometimes you can get so frustrated mm. to see the people you are praying for, they are buying new cars and new houses. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and then... Uh, and then you just go bless the new houses and the new cars and you come back in your motorcycle and, and bike home. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes it can create a bitterness in your heart and feel like, ah, ah, God, what the heck is happening now? That these people, they think I'm so loaded yet I'm poor. You see what I'm saying? Watch your heart that your messages do not get corrupted by bleeding, corrupted by need, corrupted by frustration and bitterness. Yeah. Anyway. I mean, you just brought up a point that is very important. Uh, I think people need to know, you know, yes. 
the sacrifices of, of a past of a of a pastor in the beginning mm. because because you, mm. you talked about mm. finances i think mm. it's important we go to that mm. part mm. before we get into questions and i promise you i'm gonna bring mm. this man of mm. god back one or twice you know because when when people see a pastor being blessed they don't mm. know what that pastor is <laughs> they don't know the sacrifice they just see a nice car yeah. and then a judgment is made you yeah. know yeah. so can you talk about the sacrifices of yes. a pastor yeah. so we can tackle that financial part yeah. wow i don't know where to start talking about this um I will give one example outside of our own mm -hmm. and specifically our young pastors. Mm. Uh, Pastor Joseph, Pastor Masimba, Pastor Orlando, Pastor Christian, Pastor Jose, uh, you know, Pastor, Pastor Adolf, and Pastor Claudine, and Pastor Delphine, you know, and all the other pastors uh, in Nicaragua and all those places, whatever. This one who are my children. Mm. I mean, they step out. And in all those cases, I push them out. Mm. By faith. Mm. They sacrifice. I will just give the case of Pastor Christian in Toronto. Mm -hmm. with, with four children. Pastoring his church. I mean, put your own money in. Yeah, rent. Yeah. Rent, paying the rent and everything. At that time, there's nobody. There's only 10 people. Mm. And you just pour everything you have in. Nobody look at that. Mm. Then when the church begin to grow 50, 60, 100, and the pastor begin to get blessed, the people who join in can complain. But the years of lack... Mm. And personal finances and personal sacrifices that have been poured in when there was no crowd. How do you repay that pastor for such? I mean, you pay the rent for people. I you mean, buy groceries for people. I mean, you got to do everything because there's no money There's no the fund. Church. Yeah. And then you pay people's groceries, sometimes their stuff, and you don't even have much yourself. Then you're working one job and two mm -hmm. jobs. And at that time, the church is little. Then when the church grow and the people come and we organize things with board and leadership and thing and, and people will not understand. Can you pay back that person if you want to deal with it in the perspective of a secular standing? How do you pay? I had to speak to the people of the board of uh, Toronto and tell them, the day God prospered this church, you guys need to pay some money back to Pastor Christian. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That was the heart of a father speaking. So to say what? The point is not the suffering. We are called, we're going to go through it. But at least when the pastor gets blessed and God is raising him up financially, the sheep should rejoice. I thank God for prospering fellowship people. We can speak by experience. Mm -hmm. Amazing people. They want our prosperity. Mm -hmm. They want to pour in us. They want us to be the best people. They want us to be millionaires. They want us to be rich. And I am so thankful for such. And how they are poor in our life over and over again. I mean, our family. God bless you folks who are watching from Crosspoint Fellowship. Mm -hmm. And Novellis. And Novellis part, of course. You understand what I'm saying? But nevertheless, I know a lot of pastors and many of them who have large churches, who are not from the same family as Crosspoint, but just friends, who are suffering. When they buy a car, everybody will talk about it. The blessing of your pastor is your blessing. Mm -hmm. You should be proud. It's like a child that his father is known as a wealthy man. It make your son walk differently. That's the way the people in the church should be. I mean, you know, it, it, it's so much. Let me put it this way. It's like almost because of the culture and the mindset that we were born from or grew up, uh, depending on our religious background, it's like a pastor need to be poor to mm. prove that he's spiritual. Mm. He's fasting and praying. He's so humble. 
people feel like he is humble because he has a small house. He is humble. He has one bedroom apartment and he sleep and his living room. The children sleep in the living room. He is so humble. He has just an old van that are rust everywhere. Wow. What a humble man. He's not after money. This is nonsense talk. It's nonsense. Everyone should remember that a pastor is a human being and he had to build also not only a legacy of faith, but a legacy also of finances for him and his children and great-grandchildren. We have that same responsibility. Mm. Watch me. I love hockey. People pay money, $200 ticket, to go sit down and watch a game of two hours. Mm. Watching Wayne Gretzky or Lindros or Jerome Gilner. Or, or, or Crosby. And they are excited and thrilled. Or soccer. Go watch a Barcelona playing against Real Madrid and, and Messi and Ronaldo. Wow. We go there for two, three hours. We pay 200, 500, 100. We are excited. These people just give you entertainment. In number one, they meant entertain your flesh. Not in the evil way. There is that part of you that needs still to be satisfied with entertainment, and that's fine. But nobody complains that these guys are pushing a ball. They're getting paid $10 million every six months. Nobody talk a word about that. No one. But yet there is a pastor mm -hmm. wearing his shoes with holes on it. Having two jobs delivering newspapers in the morning and working in the manufacturing at night. And he still has to prepare a message. Yet you call them, they pray for you, cast out your demon, comfort you, counsel you, run for you, stand with you. Your child is sick, they are there. Somebody in the congregation is, is, is dead, they will bury. Listen, the pastor can become crazy if it's not grace. But we don't, nobody criticize Messi. Everybody love him, even though he's making 100 million a year. By pushing a ball to entertain you to be able to have a weekend that is powerful. Yet, they have no contribution to your life in the scope of eternity. Even no contribution to your life in this life. Mm. Wow. Why should we not be blessed in that perspective? Mm -hmm. I, 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 you, you're probably catching it. So for me, um, no pastor comes in the ministry for money. Mm -hmm. At least a person who is really called. No, 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 no. It's like there are certain jobs that are so noble. You don't go there for money because money will not justify you to go in. But at the same time, a man is worthy of his hire. A man is worthy of his hire. When the congregation is small and there's nobody, it's okay. We understand that. But when the church begins to prosper, let me put this. I went to many churches. Mm. They brag mm. and they are excited because they're going to buy a building. There is a building fund. They're excited about the building fund. We, we have now about 200,000. We're just looking for another 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 so we can have the dump. We need to buy a building. They pride themselves. They have a committee to gather the money for the building. Yet the pastor has no penny as an income. Listen, in the Old Testament, no temple is a temple worthy of God's presence until there was the establishment of a priest anointed by God. If not, it was just four walls building with good decoration. Is building important? Of course. But what I'm trying to say, make sure you take care of your pastor. It's better sometimes to rent and still honor him so that he can preach better because when you honor a man of God, God honored that congregation as well. So we cannot put the building funds ahead of the welfare of the one who is your shepherd. Mm. Cut the shepherd out and the sheep scatter. Mm. So in some places, the pastor comes stand on the pulpit mm -hmm. tired, exhausted. Because 
He just finished his last shift and he just showed up to church. Yet they are bragging that they have a fund to raise to buy the building. Anyway, I think I'm going to just stop right there and let you talk. But, but for me, that's really what the key is. So from today, pray for the blessing, the benediction of your pastor. Pray for the prosperity of your pastor. If the city prosper, mm -hmm. the people who live in the city prosper. Mm -hmm. If your pastor prosper, the people in that congregation will prosper. But it is a mockery to heaven that everyone in the congregation will prosper. Yet your shepherd is a poor man. That's not glorifying to God in any form. That's right. Wow. Anyway, this is just we have three minutes before questions. Uh, this is a pastor's wife talking. I I used I used to be so frustrated at, <laughs> at some time a long time ago. You know because you are an engineer, you are smart. I could <laughs> see. You know when you used to sell sh um, yeah, electronics. Electronic used to make a lot of money. And then he goes in the ministry, Jesus. <laughs> and then, you know, the salary is cut at 99% off. <laughs> you know, to completely 99% off. And, uh, and then as a pastor's wife, you know, because you see the needs in the house, in the family, and we, we were really financially, struggling. really struggling. And... Uh, and I used to be frustrated. <laughs> I used to be so resentful, you know, to yeah. God. And, and I'm like, God, everybody's being blessed in the church. And, you know, look how we are struggling. Yeah. If my husband was an engineer, <laughs> went back to selling, we'd be making all this money. <laughs> and I really, really used to resent ministry like 100%, you know. So what you're saying is so important that, that people know. That pastors, your pastors, they have sacrificed a lot. You know, if you are in a church and you really love your pastor, it's because you know deep inside is a real pastor. And they have sacrificed a lot. I really feel for pastors yes. who, who really still have to go work, work. two jobs, yet yes. on their break they are calling ministry. After, after break they are going to, <laughs> to visit somebody. It's not on an the, easy on job. On the pause, they have to counsel and yeah. go back to the machine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So what do you think should be the priority? Before yeah. we end, we go yeah. into questions. For, first of all, I, this story just came back to me and uh, because of what my wife mentioned. And, and it's true, she felt like that for a while. Mm -hmm. But the time came where she felt like, no, it's okay. And I'll give you that example. One day, I was just sitting in my pastoral office. <laughs> it was so cold. Uh, there, there, there was no heat coming in that room, right? For those who know the church, we were in Center Street in those days. And uh, it was freezing cold. And I just started pastoring. And my boss called, and we, we were really struggling financially. Mm -hmm. In fact, we were feeding on the food bank of the yeah. church, you remember? And I was pregnant with Amadou. And I used to go get <laughs> food at the church that my husband was pastoring. So, you know, the canned foods, I would go and I would be like, you know, <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm so glad those days are over. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, you know, she's talking about those days where she will come and pick up. Listen. The poor people, the homeless will come to the church, knock at the church, asking for food. And then I will come out of my cold, freezing office, and I will pack some food with the cans and give it to them. And they say, no, no, I don't want that. <laughs> it's not fresh. <laughs> Yet, those are the cans that I was picking up to bring home, or my wife will come and select. And we, don't, we didn't want the people of the church to know yeah. because we always wanted to get in a place where we don't put our burdens on the people. And so uh, <laughs> one of these days, God has a way of doing things. And I will say, it, we passed that test. Watch mm -hmm. me. Listen to this story. I'm sitting in the office thinking, okay, uh, the, the people brought enough canned food and macaronis and tomato paste and, uh, and stuff because it was time for me to go home. And uh, my phone rang. And then I pick up my phone. It was my old boss. And his name was George Baker. I used to work for this company called Only Components. I was the cell engineer as a cell representative. 
in uh, Canada, but North America also, in some of the cities in the U.S., Vegas included. And God has raised me up in an amazing way. I was the best sell person in the whole company. Nobody come close to me in numbers. So I was very prosperous in those days. And so when we came in the ministry, lost literally everything. So I'm sitting in that office and my phone rang. And then I pick up the phone and it was my boss, George Baker. And it goes like that. He was very, very, you remember George Baker, the big guy. And he goes, Elijah. I say, yes. He say, oh, it's George. I say, hey, George, how are you doing? He say, you know what? I need you to come back right now to the company. Things are not going without you. And so you got to come back. I say, you know, George, I am called to be a pastor. <laughs> I'm not going back. And then he said, pastors? There are a lot of pastors everywhere in the world. But sales people like you, engineer sales, no way. Please, you can come. A lot of pastors, hallelujah. And he begin to say, hallelujah. <laughs> and sometimes he will fake speaking in tongues because he grew up in the church. <laughs> he said, I'm sending you a contract right now. And I'm sitting in my office. He said, what is the fax number? I gave him the fax number. He sent me a contract and he said, I will pay you 250000 That's a quarter million. Fix. Plus the bonuses depend on how much merchandise and uh, account that we open. And then I said, George, I'm not interested. I didn't know I would say those words. Listen to me. It was the spirit of God. Mm -hmm. I said, no, God, judge. I, I, now, here's a guy who's going to pick up the cans and his wife is coming to pick up the food, food bank. And he offered me a quarter million and I said, no, I don't want it. No, no, with an apartment. And no, it's, I, I, when I say I don't mm -hmm. want it, he goes... He goes, he goes, Elijah, you remember these condos of four bedroom that your wife liked in Toronto? <laughs> was... Because we had gone to Toronto for a month when you were working there. We are in downtown Toronto. St. Clair. Amazing Beautiful. place. I mean, this place was 1.5 million in those days on the market. It was a penthouse. Yeah. Uh, Rafaela was little. Yeah. Uh, we go there. And my wife and the kid will stay in the apartment. I will yeah. go to work and come back. I mean, he goes, you remember that? I say, yeah. He say, okay, you know it's belonged to me. It's paid off. There is no penny on it. Guess what? I'm sending you the title deed and the papers. You just need to go to a lawyer and a witness. I give it to you. I said, uh, you give it to me. What do you mean that I will use it? He said, no, no, no. It will be yours completely. I said, uh, the penthouse on St. Clair? He said, yeah. And a and quarter million per year? Yeah. I'm sending you the papers right now. And I'm sending you a ticket. I want you to come and see me in Florida so that we can seal this thing and get going. The only thing I want from you, you need to move to Toronto. And I said, uh, but am I going to be traveling again? He said, yes. But don't worry. I know you have a child. I know you have uh, yes, Rafaela. Every day you won't see Rafaela, I will give $100 toward Rafaela school. Just $100 every day. So if you don't see her for five days, guess what? $500 away. This is a very good deal. Very good. <laughs> the and then he goes, the and then he goes, and he goes, you remember the car that you used to have for the company car? You remember that yeah, car? The, the company see. car? I say, yeah. I will write it to you also, the pin card. Put one dollar, give it to you. I, I sat down. I was on the phone with him. And I go, George, no, I'm not interested. And suddenly my facts begin to go on. I saw a contract, quarter million. He sent me the title deed with a letter on it and the thing written. I have to go to a lawyer. I have to go to Toronto so that I can have a condo to myself. Another paper, another contract of one day not seeing his daughter because of work. $100. I got that. And the pink card of the car with $1 on it in my name. I took all this package. I said, this is a deal. I almost want to say, this is the day that the Lord had it. No, I didn't sing. I was sold for pastoring. I, I didn't care even if you offer me all the riches of the world. I did not come in pastoring for the money. And look at what God did. I took all the papers. I got the plastic bag with the food bank and I went home. 
Tu vois si ma wife. I, I put the plastic bag, she recuperated the plastic bag with the peas inside, the tomato slides and the pimopo peas and the macaroni, whatever. And then I said, you know who called me today? She said, who? I said, George Baker called me. He said, George called you? What does he want? Because my wife knew him. Uh, in those days, every January, we'll go to Las Vegas for the electronic show. So my wife will come with me some of the time. And so we, we know these people very well. And I said, okay, here's the paper you send me. This condo you like, a uh, quarter million of this. No, no. I explained to her without showing her the paper. And she said, so what did you say? Now imagine you're giving the food bank package to your wife to cook. <laughs> and then you are telling her, that your old boss call you and offer you quarter million, a condo 1.5 million, $100 for Rafi, and a car to your name. And then she asked me the question, so what did you say? Now my head went, uh, did I really say the truth? Do I, do, do I tell her what I say or not? Because I didn't know where she was at, especially before she was so frustrated seeing the capacity her husband uh, can command in the secular world, but yet we are struggling financially. So I, I begin to dance in my head. What do I say? So I told her, no, I say no. And I showed the papers. And she, she jumped on me and kissed me, one of those kisses that are special. And we destroyed the papers, jump on it, and sing to the Lord that it was not for money that we came in the ministry. No. And I called back George and I said, George, I'm not interested. I'm a pastor. And he said, you are a fool. How can you give up on such? Don't you know you will have more children? Don't you know your children will need to go to school? Don't you know that scholarship and, and the fees of school in the years coming will increase? Don't you know? Don't you know? Don't you know? I said, I do know. But we have made up our mind. It is to pastor. So I know there's a lot of pastor, but that's my choice. Mm. George never understood that. Of course, the story goes on, but no. just to say, it, mm. pastor, if you're called to pastor, don't come in for money. Mm -mm. If not, you will give up. If not, you will get wounded, manipulative. I mean, you name it. So for my wife and I, we had already broken away from the strength and the power money can have on a preacher. When we were not many, we let it go. When we we're at the deepest, deepest valley, we let it go. Today, I will say I celebrate God for his goodness and I celebrate God for a great leadership, a great team on our board, a great team in our leaders who have wisdom and understanding who honor us and our family and understood the price that we pay to stand and understand that it is a good thing to honor the person uh, that God has put above them to lead them as shepherds. Mm -hmm. So I think I say too much, but uh, yeah. And you have a lot more to say. <laughs> All right, so we're going to just leave the next 20 something minute for questions. Uh, you can text your questions, but I believe somebody already texted one. Thank you for being so strong and amazing. <laughs> Thank you, baby. <laughs> you know, because it, it's not easy. Sometimes people think being a pastor is this easy way out. Yeah. Although I know some people use it to try to, you know, get away from responsibility. But really, it's a calling that's really costly in the mm. beginning. But mm. God is so faithful. He'll always reward his people. Yes. He is so faithful. Mm. God is building us so we can build. Mm -hmm. As mm -hmm. we are building the church of God, is building us. He's yes. building our own lives. He's building our families. He's building our perspective. He's building our character, mm. integrity, fear of the Lord. Right. As we are building his church, he's building us. That's right. Mm. And for me, my greatest reward as a pastor, you know, beyond life being changed, that's just to know. Yes. That there's one, two people who really, yes. number one, look up to you, but that your contribution is important to mm -hmm. them. You know, just to they have... They value people, what you give Yes, them. who love you, who honor you, who want to, you know, do life and live with you. Uh, there's, a, you know, a satisfaction that comes from that, mm -hmm. that God would honor us 
with the the with his greatest possession Amen. which is the people of god Amen. you know and Amen. i used not to see it that way mm. because i was looking at my needs my family needs you know my my insecurity but the more you grow in god the more you realize Amen. my god this is such an honor mm. for god to even trust me yes with it whether it's few or many Amen. such a it's such a great honor so we are we are blessed yes we are as pastor i mm. i i think i'm the most blessed pastors on this yes, planet maybe you are. i don't know about you others <laughs> you know because i have amazing people yes you know so cross point people i just love you and i just want to honor you and uh, we are in this for for good for jesus yes. amen mm -hmm. so questions but i have one question here uh that was from daniela i believe uh, does a pastor need to go open their church or they can pastor in the congregation the church where they are at that was yes. the question uh that bring back so that's a very good question number one not all pastors are called to be senior pastors. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a big mistake some pastor made. There is a place for a second person. Mm -hmm. There is a place of honor to be number two. You don't mm -hmm. need to be always number one. Even though we preach this word, we are the first and not the last. But in this year, God give you and the colleague give you. There's people who are called to be helpers. And so <clears throat> you can remain in the congregation and be an associate pastor or an assistant pastor, and that could be your calling, for real. That could be your calling. It doesn't mean because you're an associate pastor that your next level now is to be senior pastor, no. Because senior pastorship, it is a different thing than being an associate. Don't, not all people will turn to become senior pastors. Mm -hmm. Some are called to be helpers, mm -hmm. to be there as to be the help, to gather people around, and shepherd amazingly but in the perspective as an associate pastor, mm -hmm. not just the senior pastor. That's right. So not everybody's called to do so. So you can be a pastor and just labor in the congregation, not always going to open a church mm -hmm. elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the other question was, how do you know you're a pastor? Uh, you know, which is a very uh, wide question. Yes, of course. As I was saying, uh, look at the way God is operating through you. Even in the natural gifts, sometimes you can look at mm. it. You know, when a person uh, run away from people, don't want to sacrifice, I don't know if pastorship will work for you because pastorship is spelled sacrifice. Mm. So if it's a person who don't like to sacrifice, who don't like to help people, um, that may not be the time for you until probably that change. So how do you know God will speak to you? Because God will call. It will speak to you in various ways. Sometimes you can just be serving and you end up being there. Or it can use the people who lead you, your pastors, your prophet, whatever it is, to guide you into it. But God will speak to your heart like any call. He will talk to you in a way or another. Mm -hmm. Amen. <clears throat> and be patient. You know, God has a way uh, to put you where you need to be at the right time. For so long, I was so convinced I wasn't a pastor. But at the right time, God did it <laughs> and I find myself into it still arguing that I'm not a pastor anyway that's for another day <laughs> you know so I don't know if we have any other questions somebody just asked me a question okay. he said Apostle how do you manage to look so young and so on it's because I have a wife that doesn't give me a hard time <laughs> that's it that's all let's not go look for anything yeah, else yeah I won't say anything else <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, he's got some good genes. The genes help as well, I guess. Yeah, and I smile a lot. I think that is a good medication, trying to stretch those muscles. Yeah, and I think because you do what you love, you know, yeah. when you do what you love, true. You know, there's no, you know, yeah. difficulties are yeah. there, but there's a sense of fulfillment. Yes, that gives you youth inside of yes. your soul. Yes. I find what God called me to do mm -hmm. is to preach the gospel, to help people, to stand to raise leaders, sons and daughters, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of the obstacle, they're a part of it. We go through it. Sometimes we'll be in two tears. Sometimes we feel discouraged. But in all in all, there's a satisfaction because I know I'm in my lane. And that gave me a smile. And uh, the genes are good. We try to keep it that way. Thank That's you, though, right. for the compliment. Yes, as a pastor, what is your biggest struggle? Oh, I'm sorry, I need to find it. Um, give me time. 
Oh, this went up. We'll find it. Thank you, Jesus. Can you be a pastor and do business? Because I, I notice that's one of the struggle to some yes. people. This is very important question. Like in everything, uh, depend on the era in which we live, there is a uh, evolving of things, all right? <clears throat> some people, I call them the Zephaniahs. Uh, they're the hidden ones. They're individual that God has capacitated with different graces who can pastor and at the same time succeed in the business perspective. Mm. It's not every pastor though. Even though every pastor would like to do that. And some of the things that push most pastors to want to do that is because of the financial struggle. So they want to live free, financially speaking. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes people can tell you, oh, you know, get a business, get going. You know, Paul was a tent maker and uh, he, he wrote half of the New Testament, yet he was tent making, providing for himself. Yes, he had the grace and the ability to do so. God called him for that. In fact, it was such a powerful call of tent making in the life of Paul that <coughs> his linen that he used to clean the towel that he had. And that's why sometimes people are selling a lot of, uh, what do you call that? Those little pieces of garment that little towel people sell with anointing oil and pray on it. Uh, Paul garment that healed people was not the garment that he used at church. It was the garment that he used to build tents. Mm. So God honor business, even as a minister. Mm. That garment was the garment when he was sweating, building tents, not preaching, right? And so some people have that calling. If you don't have, you will, it will be a calamity. That's like anything else. So don't look at just people do it and try to do it, or don't look at it because it will help you so you don't depend on the church. Those are good hearts, but if you're not called to do it, you will waste more money. Uh, it will create more problems. So you got to know really, God, why do I want to go into That's business? Right. Is it because I'm sick and tired of the congregation thinking that uh, I can do that then? You got to check your heart. So it's not out of bitterness mm -hmm. or frustration. Or is it because, you know, that will free me so I can do more of the work all this stuff, you are not called to do everything. You are called to do what God called you to do. And if business is a part of it, do it and pastor, they don't cancel one another. Mm. Amen. Amen. I have a question from Yvette. Mm -hmm. As a pastor, what is your biggest struggle in this secular world where people think and act as their own gods? What advice would you give to Christians who are evolving in this secular world? Where church has no place like work or our children's school? Yes, very good question. Uh, I don't know who, who asked Yvette. it. Yvette. Yvette, bravo. Number one, the Bible says we are the light of the world. Mm. We are not a preaching machine of the world. The light <clears throat> do not explain itself. Mm. The light display itself. Mm. So it's a manifestation, meaning by your lifestyle. You know, in the secular world, if you work in a company, your behavior will say a lot to people more than you're speaking in tongues or uh, claiming that you're a Christian mm. or sometimes trying to give instruction to people uh, and try to make them feel bad because of certain things they are doing. The best way to evangelize or to show Christ is by behaving right and by doing as Christ will do. Mm. So we have actually more responsibility in those workplaces. Mm -hmm. When you come late, it's not a very good demonstration of light. Mm -hmm. When you are the one who always complain in front of others, it's not a good demonstration of light. Mm -hmm. When you are the one who criticizes other people in the back, mm -hmm. it's not a good demonstration of light. Mm -hmm. So we have to become living epistles living by just... displaying the Christ-like life. So people see it, it distinguishs you. Mm -hmm. You'll see people will begin to give you, I remember I was in sales. Mm -hmm. And you know, in sales, they usually say, then a salesperson will not go to heaven because he will rip off his own mother. <laughs> That's a saying in the sales world, world where, where it's a profit and it's commission. So wherever you can uh, rip off and make commission for a living. So people will say that about salespeople. 
But yet, where I was working, I was always ahead of time. I always tried to have conscience that I'm an ambassador of Christ. Even though there was no church there, we didn't play music, but consciously, I have to know that I'm an ambassador. So even when I'm about to get angry about something, I will think twice, what will Jesus do in this situation? Because tomorrow, I'm, today I'm representing Christ. Because of that, people had respect for me without me preaching to them. At the point when somebody will swear, the manager will look at them and say, don't do that here, Elijah is here. And I never told them, don't swear. I never tell them it's frustrating me when they do so. But by the lifestyle, it commands respect and honor. It distinguishes you. And because of that, at the lunchtime, people will come and open up to me their family issues, asking me for advices for their children and their marriages and their finances and so on. Though I never claimed that I was a Christian, but your lifestyle speaks louder than anything you can speak for. Mm. So that's what I will recommend. Let it be the light of the world and always ask the question, what will Jesus do and have a consciousness that we are representative of Christ? Mm -hmm. And I think when you live in this world, knowing that you are here to serve mm -hmm. as a Christian, yes. you know, you, you start looking at people who don't know Christ as people who are lost. Yes. Not because they are trying to come against God. They are lost. Yes. They just need the light of God. Mm. How can I serve them so they can come to that place where they are really open to listen to what yes. I have to yes. say? Yes, yes, You know? And uh, we become servant and we become the light Amen. of God. Amen. There's a question that I said yes. as a pastor. I have it here. Okay. Is it right for a Christian to observe traditional beliefs? Uh, traditional belief, the person is talking about Christmas probably or maybe she can expound yes, while we go to the, the next, next question how do you identify your ministry or area of calling okay. I have an idea but I'd like to hear your perspective you know generally speaking I tell the people that's Dorothy yes in the church or in life whatever freak you out or frustrate you when it's not well done generally speaking that could be it's not an hundred percent Generally speaking, that's good. Let's say you go to a church and you hate the disorder. I mean, communication is bad. There is no order. We don't know what the heck is happening. It's freaking you out. Probably you should join that area. Or you get to church, you see everything is dirty. You always notice the chairs are not well put. And you feel like every, you know, chairs are not clean. You know, there's something about the atmosphere. It's not the bathroom and not the probably God will always take you in those places that get your attention and frustrate you sometime mm -hmm. inside. Mm -hmm. You could be a solution for the problem you are noticing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Mm. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right. So we're going to, we have just four minutes yes. left. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Yvette was able to expound on her question. If not, when we come back, because I need to bring you back. Okay. I have a lot of subject I want to tackle. Mm -hmm. uh, well, what can you tell us as, as the last few words that you can yeah. tell congregation, ministers? I know a lot of, uh, there's, we have a lot of, you know, hurt, misunderstanding between pastors and their people. You know, because we are living in a world where we just, yes. there's a lot of things that happen in mm. a church. And there's an, an, um, how do you, an expectation that church is a place that where everything has to be perfect. Yes. Can you explain what it is church really, yeah. you know? Yeah. <clears throat> a church is a family. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the last things I would like to say mm -hmm. to pastors mm -hmm. and Christians, your mind you have to protect your mind through prayer mm. and keeping yourself always in the place of prayer and worship. Mm -hmm. I tell you the truth. Amen. This is where all the problems begin in the church. Mm -hmm. When you do not cultivate worship to become spiritual, to connect with the heart of God, Every little thing you can read wrong in it, every little thing get you mad, 
every little thing hits you hard, every little thing become a mountain because perspective matters. If you keep yourself sharp spiritually, even the pastor, I'm talking the pastor and the people of God, you begin to have divine perspective that things that do not really count will not freak you out and make a big deal out of it. You know, when you see somebody taking an offense easily, it's because sometimes they lack to connect with what matters the most, God's perspective. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. In other words, you become more carnal than spiritual. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about congregation members, I'm talking also the pastors. When you become more carnal than spiritual, you respond based on what is leading you. Is it the carnal or is it the spirit that leads you? So worship, ministering to the Lord is so powerful. It happened to me so many times in the course of my pastoring where I will feel down. I mean, discouraged. I feel like, woe is me. Everything is collapsing. Oh my God, right? The devil is bombarding your mind. And sometimes just because of one individual complaint, you generalize it to the whole church. And you have 400 people in the church. Yet because of one complaint, it's like the other 399 do not matter. Mm -hmm. You need to be careful. Mm -hmm. So we got to keep our mind in the place of worship. Because when you enter worship, you begin to know God is only you are need. Mm -hmm. God is only you are need. Mm -hmm. You begin to see the possibility of the difficulties. You begin to see the solutions that are possible for the challenges. Mm -hmm. You begin to see like God sees. Mm -hmm. Even in that place, people who hurt you, you begin to see them differently to realize these people do this because they don't know what they're doing. I mean, Jesus stretched his arm and said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what he's doing. If you are not spiritual, you can say that. You will see them as your enemies. And when you see somebody as your enemy, you will fight back. You see? So for me, the most important is the mind. Because it's in the mind the devil gets. It's in the mind that offense comes. It's in the mind discouragement comes. It is in the mind depression comes. It is in the mind rebellion comes. It is in the mind fight comes. It is in the mind disunity comes. I mean, your mind, your mind, your mind, your mind. Your mind. Mm. Because of that, good brothers fight among themselves. Mm. Good leaders fight among themselves. Leaders fight their pastor. The pastor fight leader. Just the mind, the mind, the mind. Because when your mind is not tuned in worship and with the thought of God, you begin to accuse people. You feel like it's because of this person I'm not going. Rebellion come in your heart. And sometimes we can justify that word in any form we want. To feel like, you know what? It's my right. I want to be able to say what I feel. I want to be able to communicate my heart. But that's not the problem. It's the state of the heart. So we have to keep ourselves spiritual. That's why in our churches, prayer, we multiply the opportunities. Worship, multiply the opportunities. When people are spiritually sound and spend time in the presence of God and knowing the worship, what it does to you, there is less problem. All the little things disappear because there's an oil where everything can flow. Do we still have disagreement? Yes, but we deal with it in the perspective of respect and honor, not rebellion or fight back or division. Mm. That's, that's for me the most important. Mm. Because the rest we can give clues there, clues there, clues there. Church is a spiritual thing. It is not a mental thing. There are churches, listen to me, you can be organized until, I mean, even IBM or the White House will come and learn from you. But yet, you will see fighting happening all the time. It is spiritual. There is an enemy. And that enemy is not your neighbor or the pastor or the congressional member. His name is Satan. He is the enemy of the church. And he will use our weaknesses as a platform to operate his agenda in the church. A church is a spiritual entity. It is an organism. It's not just an organization. Though we need an organization for the, 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 the operation of the thing. But don't be fooled for a minute mm -hmm. that the church is like IBM or Apple or the church is like your organization where you work. No, 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 no. There is a spiritual involvement in this thing. 
that had nothing to do with an organization. That's right. So we have to be spiritual. Mm. That's why Paul said, no, no man by the flesh, but by the spirit. If you can discover who your pastor is in the spirit, you will increase faith in that building. It will preach deeper revelation mm. and you will honor him. But if you just look at him as a human being, based on his weaknesses, mm. it's over. Mm. And therefore, church pastors also need to pray to know the people around him, especially his leaders. Mm. Know them by the spirit, not just by the flesh. If not, you will just cast them out. That's right. Spirit. Wow. Spirit. That's right. That's why Jesus said, I will build my church. He didn't say, I will build a, a CEO, uh, a, 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 sorry, an IBM. He said, I will build my church. Church. Jesus said, I will build my church. Mm. Oh. Jesus. Yeah. Thank you so much. So. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm very excited about this topic yes. because Jesus is the builder of the church. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I, need, I need you to answer the last question of Jess. And Justin, I'll make sure we answer that question through writing as we are out of town. But be, time, because we asked Jess to, to expound a little bit. I mm. need you to answer. Uh, so traditional beliefs like going to uncles for blessings, taking goats to elders, for cleansing of names or stuff like that. It must be oh. traditional uh, okay. customs yeah. in the past. Yeah, so. yeah. You know, we respect our leaders and our mm -hmm. elders. Mm -hmm. Fathers, mothers, uncle, we respect. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that we have to obey the gray hair. Mm -hmm. We have to, not obey, we have to honor, to mm -hmm. submit unto them. Mm -hmm. We should never play a rebellious behavior. Now, there is a difference between submit and obedience. Don't miss that. We submit by the hard attitude to grant honor to a person. I'll give you in the scriptures. Daniel submitted to King Nebuchadnezzar, but he disobeyed him. Submission is a matter of the heart. So, even though I don't agree, I still submit to you in the perspective of honoring you. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with husband and wife. Mm -hmm. Wife, submit to your husband. Doesn't, my, doesn't mean whatever I tell my wife she must do. No, no, no. But even if she say no, she should do it in an honorable way. All right? And so, when they ask you to bring goat, because of your grandfather that died, his spirit still hang around to worship, or to honor your grandfather's spirit. By the standard of scripture, men die once, then come the judgment. So we do not believe that dead people are coming back in that perspective, except at the end of time when Christ back, come back with the church. And those who will be dead will rise up, and those who are up will come down. Do you understand? And so I can tell my uncle, Papa, who uncle, from my belief system as a Christian, mm. I honor you and I love you, but I cannot bring the goat because the blood of Jesus has been shed already. And therefore, I don't need any shedding of any animal blood for the forgiveness of my sins or delivering me from a curse. Mm. And Jesus Christ, do not honor that goat you're going to kill. So you might be killing it to a divinity. You don't need to explain that to him. That's, I'm just adding that for you to know. Because you are not there to make him feel bad and disrespect him and challenge him. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. Just tell him, because of my belief, I want you to honor it. I can do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we don't believe in those traditional things that contradict the scripture. That's Nevertheless, there are some traditional things that do not contradict the scripture and therefore, there is nothing wrong to stand in that perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, giving a diary, it is scriptural. That's a tradition. Some people do. If they don't do it, it's okay. But if they do it, of course, we'll buy into it. But not in the perspective to purchase a person. So mm -hmm. you understand. Mm -hmm. If it's contradict the scripture, you should not. But mm -hmm. you should not insult them and make them feel bad and raise your voice and all this stuff. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Apostle. My this pleasure. has been amazing. <laughs> so we have, I have a lot of projects in my mind. So, so we can just tackle for our yeah. next conversation. 
this is from the heart of pastors to you we just want to tell you we love you we are in this for jesus and Amen. for you and uh, it's an honor and um a grace that god has given any mm. pastor mm. to minister to mm. the congregation we love you so much and uh, we'll see you Pray again cross point family we love you so much okay. facebook family we love you so yes. much uh apostle would like to pray, like to pray for, for us at the end mm. yes hallelujah father in the name of jesus mm. i want to pray for the shepherds on this platform mm. Everyone who's been disappointed, mm. who felt betrayed, mm. condemned, rejected, dishonored, whatever it might have been, Father, I pray you bring healing to their hearts. Embrace them. Embrace them. Let healing come to their heart in the name of Jesus Christ. Those who feel lonely, encourage them. Strengthen them, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Mm. I want to pray also for congregation members who have been hurt, mm. who have been disappointed, mm. who felt also betrayed. Mm -hmm. Father, I pray for healing. I pray for peace in their heart. Mm. Let the oil flow upon those wounds. Father, I feel like in some cases we vow that I will not trust anymore any church. I will not church trust anymore any pastor. Uh, and the pastor also could feel like I will just preach to them, but I won't get close anymore. Uh, I will not sacrifice to a certain extent anymore. Uh, I will not trust any leaders anymore around me and so on. Father, I pray that those walls may fall. Destroy those walls. Destroy those walls. Destroy those walls in the name of Jesus Christ. We destroy those vows, those inner vows that have been spoken or thought about. We cancel them in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, let joy come to congregation members. Let joy come to pastors. Let peace come to congregation members. Let peace come to pastors. Let love and honor and respect come to one another, for one another. Lord, where there was a gap of separation, bring them back together again in the bond of love, sealed by the Holy Spirit. Father God, those who have said, I will not go anymore to any church. Father, give them peace. Visit them, speak to them, and you heal their heart. Make them know how important is the gathering in the house of the Lord. The community of the believers, even though there is imperfection in each person. Father God, I bless those who are watching right now. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let every congregational person begin to understand. They passed the more they never done before. Let them begin to gather around their leadership. Let the leaders begin to gather around their pastors. Let the pastor begin to look back to the leaders. Giving room to each other to be able to stand in the bond of love and trust as a family. And I come in the name of Jesus again, the devourer. I come in the name of Jesus again, Satan, the divider. I come again, the accuser, in the name of Jesus. I rebuke him from your congregation. I rebuke him from your family. I rebuke him from your life in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Father, I release abundance to the church as we are lining in the confines of love and honor and respect, submission. Let this vision begin to flourish. Let a fresh anointing begin to flow from the heart of each pastor. Let the messages begin to be profitable, impactful, life-changing, life-transforming in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for the congregation members that they will grab the ingredients of every word, that they may begin to be pregnant by the seed of the word spoken and command that they may be prosperous in this world, that they may be your voice in this world, that have been taught they will begin to manifest your glory in their workplaces, 
in the environment of the secular world in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I release prosperity, 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 growth, increase, salvation, deliverance, healing in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Marakatola Mayakata. Let each person begin to see a fresh vision of Jesus Christ, a fresh vision of the Master, a fresh vision of Elohim, the fresh vision of the foundation of the church, the fresh vision of the builder of the church. Yes, he is the architect of the church. He is the architect of the body. He is the architect of your life. He is the head of the church. We honor him, O God Almighty. We honor you, Jesus. We celebrate you, O Jesus. Increase the grace upon the life of each person watching today for the ministry to you, a ministry of worship to you, a ministry of prayer to you. Thank you for altars of fire. Thank you for altar of prayer. Thank you for altar of worship because we want to minister to you first before we minister to the world. Out of the ministry to you, we will overflow to ministry to the world in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you and thank you for having me, baby. Thank I feel you. this word in my spirit mm. is for a minister. I don't know where you are, who you are. Mm. I feel God is telling you that it is God who builds his church. Sometimes yes. because we want to do well, we want to build a strong and big ministry. Mm. We can have a tendency to try to, 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 to yeah. use the wisdom of this world. Yes. You know, uh, it's God who builds the church. Uh, he has given in you what it takes to build the church. Yes. It might take time, but it is God. Stick to the word of God. Stick Amen. to God's way. And let him build the church for Amen. you. Hallelujah. Let's Amen. not be influenced yes. with that spirit, that mega spirit, yes. mega church spirit. Yes. Where it has to be big, mm. it has to be flashy, mm. it has to be powerful yes. to the eyes. It is God who built the Amen. church. Hallelujah. And from this world, spirit of entitlement, spirit of control. Mm. Uh, Sometimes you get in the place you want to have a hand on everything. Mm. Or you take ownership. Mm. This is stewardship. Mm. And that's applied to pastors, that apply to leaders, mm. that apply to department heads, or people who are entrusted with an authority to operate. Everything that we have, Every field is mm. being given. Mm. Mm. It's not ours. So it's not an ownership. The church does not belong to me. Mm -hmm. It is stewardship. Yes. So we break the spirit of entitlement in the Jesus name of Jesus name Christ. Jesus the spirit of control we break in the name in of name Jesus of Christ. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One day one of my pastors said, Oh my God, finally I give the key of the church to God. And I told him, what were you doing with the key of the church anyway in the first place? Mm. Let's give to God what belongs to God mm. and remain stewardship. God mm. bless you. We love you so much. <laughs> we'll see you again. God bless Hallelujah. you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bye now. Bye now. <laughs>